This is Share the Vision, presented by the Resource Center, a discussion of the programs and services of the Resource Center and about issues related to individuals with disabilities. Today, we're going to get an update for Toys for Tots as we begin. But first, Steve Watterson, Community Relations Director at the Resource Center, thank you for welcoming me back to the administrative offices here on Dunham Avenue. Thanks for coming down, Dennis. Now, as we record this, it is Parade Day. As you mentioned, there's a real spirit that fills this place on Parade Day because uh, the Resource Center is one of the sponsors of the Holiday Parade in Jamestown every year, and uh, people uh, get excited. Oh, we're very excited. Um, we're, let's see, we're probably about six hours from the start of the, the walk-off of the parade. We've got some snow in the forecast for later on, so everybody will be in the mood. But, uh, yes, this is, the I believe, the ninth year that the Resource Center has been Uh, one of the major sponsors of the parade. We're doing it with uh, Lutheran this year, which we're very happy to be partnering with them. And uh, it's just a way for the for the Resource Center to say thanks, to give back to the community, and say thank you for all the support that uh, that we receive uh, from the community throughout the year. We couldn't do it without them, and um, we're happy to sponsor the parade. It's always a fun, magical time. I guess the important thing for us to say at this moment is thank you for attending that parade, since it was last night, as uh, this is being broadcast on Saturday morning on WJTN. But Terry Johnson, one of the coordinators for Toys for Tots, joins us now at Dunham Avenue. Terry, thanks for spending a few minutes with us. I know you have a busy day, too. Yes, thank you. I'm glad that uh, I could be here. I got corralled on my way out of the building, and Steve found me, so he thought we'd give a few-minute update on what's going on with Toys for Tots. Well, and it's very important, because as we noted on our last full edition of Share the Vision, there's a very short time between Thanksgiving and the toy sorting and delivery time this year. So how are you doing? Are you getting the toys that you need? Are you getting the donations that will help you? You know, it's always hard to tell because we haven't sorted out the toys yet, and as people are bringing them in, they just are stacking up in a pile. Um, But I was telling Steve just a little bit ago, I, as always, am concerned. It doesn't look like we have quite enough where we have been in the past. Um, And I was talking to Mike Volk, one of the other coordinators, uh, just a few minutes ago about um, where we think we're at, and we're thinking that... um, we're hoping that we're going to get a lot coming in last minute. December 13th, this um, fr- next Friday, is when all of the barrels will be coming back in. Um, and then we'll be sorting on the 14th and bagging and distributing on the 15th. So people have less than a week, as this is broadcast, to get a toy or toys into that barrel so that they can be taken then to Toy Central, which is at the train station in Jamestown this year, and be sorted. So uh, this is really uh, kind of sweat time for this. It is. It is a critical time for us right now. Um, As we mentioned before, everything is earlier this year. So we are really um, kind of on crunch time this next week to to get things going and hopefully being able to meet all of the needs in the community. Our application numbers appear to be right where they've been in the past. It's Again, we're still putting them all on the computer and trying to get a total final count, but we're not there yet. But um, we're going to be you know, well over 2,000 children again this year, I'm sure. So in order to make sure that those children have a Merry Christmas and have toys under the Christmas tree, people need to donate them now. What about volunteers? What other needs can the community help you with, Terry, for Toys for Tots? We'll be looking for volunteers on Saturday, December 14th, starting at 10 a.m. to help sort toys. And we start at 10 a.m. and go until whenever it's done. It just depends on how many volunteers are there um, and how long it takes, and that's going to be at the train station. And then on Sunday, December 15th, we'll be um, at the train station again starting at 8 a.m. until whenever we're finished bagging up the orders, bagging up the toys. Um, And then we'll start distributing that afternoon, so we'll need some volunteers for that. We won't need as many as we need in the morning for bagging, but... Um, we're going to try to maneuver ourselves a little different. We're in a different space this year, so we're going to we're trying to set up um, the area to make it best fit. You know, a hundred volunteers coming in and a thousand bags of toys. So it's going to be a challenge for us. So you're going to make it as smooth a process as possible for uh, everyone, uh, and especially the volunteers who are giving their time that weekend. How can people volunteer? Can they just come down? Do you need them to contact you? For those two days, we just want them to show up. We, they don't need to call us and check in. So just come that day and sign up, sign up and we'll uh, find something for you to do. A week from today, as this is broadcast on Saturdays when you first need people. Absolutely. What time of day? 10 a.m. 10 a.m., one week from today, as this is broadcast at the... Uh, 
Gateway Station, the former Erie Railroad Station in downtown Jamestown. Terry, I know your time is precious today, as we mentioned at the outset. Is there anything else we should announce or have you announce on behalf of Toys for Tots before you break free from this radio interview? Yes, I just want to um, put it out there that if there's anybody that has not yet signed up for Toys and is in need this year, we did set a date for um, late applicants to come in and apply. And if we have Toys available, we will ch- we'll try our best to accommodate that need. And that's going to be Monday, December 16th from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Again, at the train station, which is 211 West 2nd Street. Um, And what they need to bring with them is the identification for themselves and their children and proof of income. And if we at all possible can fill the orders, we certainly will. Um, The last several years now we've added this date in there as a last late last minute thing. And we usually get probably another couple hundred children that we serve at that time. And cash contributions you will still accept? Absolutely, all cash contributions, because what we'll do, too, on that 16th, if we have applications that comes in and we have money available, we'll go buy toys so they can come back the next day and pick up. And that check should be made out to? Toys for Tots. Terry, thank you for your time on this busy day. Thank you. Have a good holiday. Terry Johnson, one of the three coordinators, along with Heather Brown and Mike Volk of Toys for Tots in the Chautauqua County area through the Resource Center, the Marine Corps Reserves Toys for Tots, coordinated in Chautauqua County by the Resource Center. Steve Watterson, that sounds like it's kind of a critical juncture. Uh, This is sort of a critical juncture for them right now. Absolutely. Um, You know, it's uh, it's amazing to me every year uh, the a couple of things, that there's so many uh, people, children in need. Uh, You know, Terry referenced, I think we helped maybe 2,300 children uh, through the Toys for Tots program last year, uh, and that represented maybe 970 families, so just under 1,000. You, know, you see the uh, the latest community report card that the United Way has been talking about and, and the levels of poverty here in Chautauqua County. So it's it's a stark reality that a lot of people are struggling and are, are in need. On the plus side, the level of uh, the generosity of the community to be able to provide toys to to everybody who needs them, all those children, uh, you know that we like to give uh, one big toy and one stocking stuffer every year. So you have roughly 2,400, 2,500 children. That's 5,000 toys that we need to uh, come up with every holiday season. And we always think that we're not going to make it, but we always do. And it's uh, just because of uh, the kindness uh, and the generosity of the community that we're able to make that happen. Steve, we have a few extra minutes today on Share the Vision uh, without as crowded an agenda as we sometimes have on this radio program to talk about some general issues here at the Resource Center and some things that we need to or should make the public aware of or remind them of once again. So I'm going to let you start that conversation, take it whatever direction you want to. Yeah, we we really didn't script this one out this time. And um, I thought we'd just spend a little bit of time. You know, we've been doing this program for... 18 years, something many, like many that. Years, it's been a yeah. long time. And I think a, you know, a lot of people, um, when they hear of the Resource Center, probably the first thing that pops into their head is, okay, that's the organization that helps people with disabilities. And certainly that's the, the crux of our mission. That's something we've been doing since 1959. I think a lot of people still, although we think we get the message out there pretty well, but I think a lot of people are still very surprised to hear that we're a major manufacturing uh, force in the region. Um, We have manufacturing centers in Jamestown and Dunkirk uh, that provide jobs to hundreds of people with disabilities every year. Um, Our our annual revenues uh, can fluctuate uh, anywhere from $25 million to $50 million. I mean, it's an incredible amount of business that's being done right here in Chautauqua County. And that's just the manufacturing income? Right, and that is uh, and that it comes from two things. You know, some of it is through some subcontracting work that we do for local industry, and there's you know probably seventy to a hundred businesses that we work with uh, annually, um, doing uh, doing subcontracting work for them. And then you know the other thing that we do, uh, which is pretty major, is we uh, make a number of items for the federal government. Most of that is for various branches of the armed services. A lot of it is sewn, S-E-W-N, you know, using industrial sewing machines to uh, make uh, clothing or pouches, for the most part, uh, that are used by uh, soldiers overseas. Um, again, an uh, incredible amount of work that's being done here in Chautauqua County. 
uh, that really has a, a, an international uh, uh, flavor to it uh, for all the items that get sent overseas and just something that a lot of people aren't aware of. And if you're hearing this on the air for the first time and say, wow, I didn't know the Resource Center did that, uh, please give us a call. We'd love to have you come down and give you a little tour. If you're a business owner, you may uh, find out that uh, the Resource Center is able to uh, to help you with some of your manufacturing needs. So we've got um, supporting people with disabilities, trying to give them a better life. We've got the manufacturing aspect. And then the other thing that people are surprised to know is uh, if they're aware that we uh, provide health services to people, uh, they think that it's just for people with disabilities, and that is not the case. Um, we have a primary care office here in Jamestown that is open to anybody. In fact, my uh, primary care physician is right here at the Resource Center, Dr. Manier. Um, we also have dental services that are offered in Jamestown and Dunkirk. Uh, things like occupational therapy, physical therapy, you know, audiology, the hearing aids, uh, podiatry, you know, foot and ankle care, speech therapy. So I think a lot of people, if they are aware that we provide those services, they're not aware that they're open to anybody in the community. Well, and just over the last week at separate times, I've seen Steve Risker, who's been a guest on this program any number of times, who uh, takes care of the medical services here. I don't have his exact title, uh, but uh, uh, he is responsible for medical services here, and Leanna Luca Conley, who uh, is responsible for mental health. And uh, they both made me aware of the fact that there are some changes, particularly in mental health, in terms of locations that are just taking place uh, as uh, the year comes to an end here in terms of the long-term facility used on 4th Street and uh, moving some of the care that uh, mental health care that uh, took place there to the Kappa building at 880 a second. Right. Well, we, you know, we, didn't, we didn't close the building, and we closed it in the sense that there uh, aren't services there anymore, but we moved all of those services over to the Kappa building. Better said by you. <laughs> and uh, then recently our, you know, we, have, we have two mental health programs, behavioral health programs. We have our counseling and psychiatric services, which had operated at 4th Street, is now down at the Kappa of building and that's uh, you know for anybody who's going through some difficulty in their lives uh, you know job stress uh, grief because of the death of a loved one uh, divorce relationship issues anything like like that you would come to our counseling and psychiatric services office the other thing we offer is our called our pros program our passages pros program pros p r o s stands for personalized recovery oriented services and those services are geared toward people with more chronic and persistent mental illness and trying to get those folks back to be reintegrated into the community in terms of having a, a safe place to live, having a job, getting some education, being involved in the community. Uh, that PROS program, which for years has been located at 712 West 8th Street this past week, also moved down to the Carl Kappa building on 2nd Street. So we now get our primary care, our uh, dental services, our counseling and psychiatric services, and those pros mental health programs all located under one roof. So that makes it uh, better for the staff and to serve the public and that all of the mental health services are coordinated from one location now uh, in Jamestown. Yep, and, and the, 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 you know, the bigger driver for that, Dennis, is um, we're in the midst of implementing a, uh, what we call a broad-scale broad uh, system integration plan in which we are, are really looking at everything from a care coordination model and looking at each individual in a holistic way to try to uh, enhance each person's entire life. So we've developed something that we call the STARS model, STARS, S-T-A-R-S, S stands for System Transformation with Accountability, Results, and Satisfaction. And it's really geared toward helping each person uh, along their life spectrum and making sure they've got good physical health, making sure they've got good mental health, make sure, making sure that their family situation is okay, uh, making sure that they've got a job or if they don't have a job that they're uh, somehow involved in the community. Um, this is something that uh, we're just starting to implement now. It's going to be several years in the making, and we're going to need some help with this. It's going to be a multi-million dollar program, uh, multi-million dollar project to implement, fully implement the STARS model, and we don't have that funding for ourselves right now. So we have uh, made some presentations to the local foundations to make them aware of what's going on and what our needs are, and uh, we will be rolling out a campaign to the general community and making everybody aware of this, uh, you know, probably in the next few months. I think that um, 
one thing that people aren't aware of is the important role that the resource center plays in our community's mental health, or sorry, our community's entire health care system. Uh, we're one of the few providers that accepts Medicaid. If uh, the resource center had to go away, if we couldn't uh, pro- afford to provide services anymore, a lot of people who uh, on Medicaid or have other challenges in accessing a health care provider are, what are they going to be doing for their health care? They're going to be using the emergency room as their primary care physician, and that just drives up everybody's health care costs. So uh, we are implementing our STARS model. We're very excited about it, and uh, we'll be rolling this out to the community sometime very soon. Well, and certainly it's been controversial, but there's a national priority to make more care, better care, accessible to those who've had no care or who have uh, been um, marginalized in terms of the availability of uh, care to them. And so uh, if the Resource Center were not able to provide this care anymore, that would be a real step backwards in an environment in which politics aside, I think our social conscience is saying to us that we need to do a better job by some means or another of providing that care for those who are underserved or not served at all. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the other thing, too, is with the changes coming in health care, the Obamacare and the changes taking place on the state level uh, in terms of the way services are provided, you know, the Resource Center is pretty uniquely positioned to be able to address the way the, uh, the new system is going to be. You know, we've got the, the health care, the mental health, we've got the employment services. So we're able to, uh, to do a lot of things all under one roof, if you will, certainly within one agency, and, uh, and be able to take care of a person's entire needs. That, you know, that care coordination piece is, is really the key, and it's something that we've uh, become very good at in the last few years and is going to be the, the prime mover going forward. There, looking back at the year 2013, there have been many transformations, many of them gradual, but many transformations here at the Resource Center. That certainly is one of them because you talked at the outset of this section of our program today about the Resource Center uh, primarily being known as a place that serves persons with disabilities. Under the STARS model in particular, there are a lot of other people in the community, people in the listening uh, area, who could be served by the Resource Center, even though they are not uh, handicapped or disabled and in the way that one would traditionally define that for the Resource Center. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, just uh, a lot of, let's say you're going to uh, one place for primary care, you're going to another place to get some counseling, you're going uh, someplace else for some physical therapy. Um, Those systems or those providers maybe aren't all talking with one another. So if you come to the resource center, you know, get involved with, uh, with our care management system. You know, our providers are all talking to one another. They're sharing that, uh, you know, your, your medical records among the different departments. So the, uh, somebody in our uh, counseling and psychiatric services office will know that you've been in to see the primary care physician and vice versa so that, you know, somebody is, is aware of your total situation and it's not being piecemealed amongst a, a bunch of different providers in the community. So it's just going to result in better care for somebody uh, that's really targeted toward your overall health and making you the uh, healthiest, best person that you can be. One of the other transitions or set of transitions that I have observed here just doing this radio broadcast during the year 2013 is that as the models change for the provision of service or the providing of service at the state or federal levels, the Resource Center must adapt and change as well in order to continue to maintain what are essential services to your traditional consumers, those uh, families who have individuals with handicaps or disabilities, and try to put that together in a new way so that the services can be continued, sustained, enhanced perhaps in a completely different funding environment. Am I saying it right? Absolutely, yeah. That's a key point, Dennis. And um, a lot of changes are taking place at the state and federal levels. And our concern is that families aren't aware of it. You know, we're trying to get the word out. But, you know, particularly if you're somebody who has a loved one with a disability who's been involved with us for 20, 30, 40 years, you just kind of assume that everything is, is going along perfectly fine and it's going to continue to be that way. That is not the case. Um, the big thing that we've been dealing with the last few months is, uh, and I won't get into the whole story behind this, it would take too long, but New York State has to submit a plan to the federal government uh, to kind of renew its Medicaid contract uh, for the next five years. What the state has proposed doing is taking uh, pre-vocational services, which is kind of work training services that uh, are the types of things that are provided to individuals with disabilities in our work and employment centers in Jamestown and Dunkirk, 
that we've been doing these for you know 40 plus years uh, saying that those services can no longer be provided in that setting because they view it as an integrated setting and instead you would have to get those pre-vocational services those work training services at a community job or at a job out in the community um, this is uh, something that's taking people by surprise. They're not aware of it, and people aren't happy about it. You know, you've got somebody who's been going to our work center for 30 years. They may not be interested in going out and getting a job. Now, we, you know, we would love to see everybody who wants to have a job out in the community have a job out in the community, but not everybody wants that. And we're not sure that their capacity is there. Are there enough jobs out in the community for everybody with a disability who wants a job? So, we had a uh, we had a part of a forum that took place in Buffalo Regional Forum last month to come up with some uh, ideas and solutions to present to New York State before they the state has to submit its final plan to the federal government uh, by January first. And uh, you know we certainly are in favor of helping people with disabilities who want to get a job out in the community to get a job out in the community. But let's make sure that um, the work center option remains an option for a person if that's what they want to keep doing. And so these things are complicated, intricate, and uh, evolving even as we speak, and yet have the potential to directly impact the consumers of the resource center, those who have worked at your uh, employment centers, and others in the community very directly, very soon. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, who knows when, the, when these would take effect. Uh, although as of uh, July 1st of this past year, we were not uh, allowed to accept any new people into the work center program. You know, people, people coming out of BOCES, you know, they, that's not an option for them anymore. Um, you know, the other thing, too, we're talking about employment, but the, these new state and federal uh, guidelines or uh, regulations – could impact the delivery of services in our residential settings, uh, the way services are delivered, uh, other types of home and community-based services are delivered. We're going to be having uh, an informational meeting, a couple of them, um, coming up uh, next, uh, what's the 10th? Is that Tuesday? Yes. Tuesday the 10th in Dunkirk at our facility on Lakeshore Drive, but then the following Monday, December 16th, at our administrative offices the old Celeron School on Dunham Avenue starting at 6 o'clock, and this is for individuals with disabilities, uh, their families and caregivers, you know, even our own staff, other people interested to come down and, and learn about this stuff because if you don't know what's going on, you're not keeping abreast of this, you are going to be caught by surprise when these changes take effect. Well, and these changes, are they even cast in stone yet? Do you know what changes are going to be coming in the area of uh, community and home services? Not yet. No, some of the, some of the changes are cast in stone. Uh, some of them aren't. You know, the, as I said, with, uh, certainly with the employment uh, issue, um, the state is still accepting uh, recommendations, suggestions before they submit their fi- its final plan. So uh, we can, they can, people can still do that, um, and we can give people information about that if they want to come to the forum or if they want to call us. But um, there, you know, and uh, not to say that all these changes are bad. You know, some of these changes are, 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 I mean, they're all aimed at giving people with disabilities the best life possible. And a lot of these changes are going to provide new opportunities for people, more. Um, uh, individualized, self-directed plans for people. They really can choose their life and choose the way that they want to do it. So there's a lot of positives that can come from this, but there are some things that, are, that threaten the uh, traditional way services are provided. We think, we think you know, the new stuff is great, but let's keep the old stuff available for people who still want it. You know, people that, that, that that's their choice, that they wish to continue that way, fine. For folks that want to be able to branch out and do something new, then absolutely let's give them the, the tools and the supports they need to be able to do that. Is there a timetable that you can see a point in the future in the next year, Steve, when this will be settled down and you will know the landscape, the new landscape, well enough so that you'll be able to say these are the services that we can offer, this is the way that we will do this now? Um, you know, it's a challenge. There were some things, some changes, uh, state-mandated changes that uh, have gone into effect that uh, the state is a little bit, I think, you know, the timetable's been a little little rushed, and they don't have all of their ducks in a row yet. So uh, it's a lot of things are still in flux. Uh, so it is hard to say when uh, all, some of this stuff has already taken effect. Uh, it's hard to say when all of it will take effect. Well, and I know you know many uh, consumers of the resource center who are in the age range of 20, 30, 40, or older, whose parents are also aging, and they have, in cooperation with the resource center, done everything that they 
could do to provide uh, services and, uh, and a good life for these individuals, and it must be particularly threatening to them as well as to you here to try and figure out what changes to make, how, how to piece this all together on this unknown timeline. Well, yes, and fear the unknown, right? Um, again, I, you know, the parents and the families that are, that are paying attention to the issue, they are, they are concerned. Um, again, we are just worried that there are so many families out there that aren't hearing the message that, that these changes are coming. And that's why we're hoping folks will come to the, the meeting, since we're talking about Jamestown, the meeting on the 16th. Again, that's at 6 o'clock at the Celeron School to learn more about this. Because, um, you know, every, everybody is going to be touched in one way or another by this, every individual with a disability uh, and their families. And it's better to be ahead of the game and know what's going on so that uh, you're positioned well uh, to be able to adapt and move forward. Steve, we have three minutes remaining on today's edition of Share the Vision, and it really is a very provocative and informative program today. And Thank you for taking the time to talk to me and to our listeners about this. I see you have the membership uh, card benefit list for the Resource Center just by your right arm there. I didn't want to use all the time before we had an opportunity to talk about that. Right. I think um, something that the, most people aren't aware is that the Resource Center is a, a membership organization. You know, anybody can become a member of the Resource Center. And membership just means that you pay your dues, which currently are $5 a year. I think they've probably been $5 a year for the last 40 years. Um, you pay your membership dues, uh, your annual dues, and you are considered a member of the Resource Center. And really, that's just saying that you support uh, the Resource Center's mission of um, improving life for people with disabilities. And what we do in, in terms of membership, you know, you will get our newsletters and uh, email correspondence. In order to uh, say thank you to individuals who decide to become members, we uh, have some agreements with about 20 local businesses in which they offer discounts to our members. And, um, you know, some of them, if, you know, if your membership dues are $5, uh, you can get that back by in, in one trip to, uh, you know, to Applebee's or, uh, or going to getting your car service. So um, I guess I, since it's, we're in December, we'll be gearing up for the 2014 uh, benefits, membership benefits. I uh, just want to let people know that we do uh, accept membership any time during the year. Again, it's only $5. We'll give you a little membership card. And you can take that card out to the businesses that are on our discount list and present your card, and they will be happy to honor you as a TRC member and give you that discount. Um, to businesses out there, um, if you're interested in joining our membership program, we would love to have you. you know, we do reach out to some new businesses every year, but we can't reach them all. So uh, just give me a call. Again, my name is Steve Watterson uh, at the Resource Center, and I will uh, be able to uh, to sign you up for the program but it's a nice thing for business you know we have uh, at any given time we have between 800 and a thousand people so you uh, you know by giving this discount you're effectively reaching out to that many folks and sure not everybody's going to use the discount at your business but enough are and you know you're trying to drive people through the door and they're hopefully having a good experience and telling their families and friends and you're getting more people through your door so resource center membership contact steve watterson directly if you're interested in joining or if you're interested in adding a benefit to the list absolutely well, Steve Watterson, uh, at this busy time of the year, again, I'm grateful for this half an hour to talk to you about these general issues here at the Resource Center, as well as Toys for Tots. And again, Terry Johnson will need volunteers next weekend, a week from today, beginning at 10 o'clock in the morning, to sort and to begin to prepare to distribute this year's Toys for Tots. If you've not contributed a toy or toys between now and then, or want to make a cash contribution, and you don't know how or where to do that, please call the Resource Center's main number here, because they will be more than grateful to hear from you this year. To Steve Watterson and Terry Johnson, thank you for sharing the vision today.